listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our president, Mark Bailey, is in the Bahamas for the next couple of days in ministry. At least that's what he told me. Uh, I choose to believe him. So I'm sure he'll appreciate our prayers and, uh, and our good wishes as well. Our chapel speaker today is Dr. Abraham Curavilla, Assistant Professor of Pastoral Ministries. Abraham holds a doctorate in medicine, a PhD in immunology, a THM in pastoral leadership from Dallas Seminary, and a PhD in New Testament and hermeneutics from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And uh, it just came to my attention today that his research work has just been published in the Library of New Testament Studies, Text to Practice, Hermeneutics and Homiletics in dialogue. And I'm sure that you'll have an opportunity to uh, look into this. And I noticed also that he has dedicated it to his teacher, colleague, neighbor, friend, brother in Christ, Timothy Warren. And so it's a nice tribute to a mentor in his life. Dr. Curavilla centers his ministry around the art and science of preaching. And there are three E's that help us remember that. Exploring preaching through research and scholarship, explaining preaching by training the next generation of church leaders, and exemplifying preaching in regular pulpit engagements. Before joining the DTS faculty full-time in 2007, he was an adjunct professor in pastoral ministries, and he has served as an interim pastor in several churches, including Plano Bible Chapel, where he was ordained. Dr. Curavilla is a diplomate of the American Board of uh, Dermatology and he maintains an active clinical schedule. Single by choice, he has special interest in the theology of Christ-centered singleness and celibacy. Currently, Abraham is assisting Schofield Memorial Church during its pastoral transition. And I would like you to join with me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Abraham Curavilla. He was the most brilliant man ever to be born in the United States. At the age of 18 months, he was reading the New York Times. At three, his father taught him the Greek alphabet, and he promptly began reading the poet Homer in Greek, of course. At the same time, he taught himself how to read Latin as well. When he was six years old, he could speak seven languages fluently. At eight, he passed MIT's entrance exam, and at nine, Harvard's, but they judged him too young to enter. They made him wait till he was 11. (laughs) He graduated from Harvard at the age of 16 while already teaching part-time. His IQ was between 250 and 300. Bear in mind that Albert Einstein's IQ was only a paltry 200. William Sidus was his name. And I can tell from the utterly blank looks on your face <laughs> that you have no idea who I am talking about. Amazing, isn't it? With that kind of intelligence, you have never heard of him. So brilliant he could conquer any language in one 24 hour day. He died in 1944, aged 46. What was he doing, you ask? He was working as a minor clerk, doing menial duties in a New York business office. Sidus had wasted his life pursuing trivia, shirking responsibilities, turning down great opportunities to die unknown, unheard. Started well, but didn't finish strong. In Christian life also, it's not just how we start the race that matters, but also how we finish. How will you finish 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now? This morning, I'd like for us to look at a biblical character who finished strong. His name was Caleb. And at the outset, let me tell you the secret from God's own mouth 
Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. Numbers 14, 24. God's own testimony about his servant, Caleb. Numbers 14, 24. My servant, Caleb, has had a different spirit and has followed me fully. Followed me fully. What's interesting about this three-word phrase is that it reoccurs three more times in the life story of Caleb and in the mouths of three other individuals. In Joshua 14, 8, you don't have to turn there, Caleb himself confesses, I followed my God fully. In Joshua 14, 9, Moses acknowledges, acknowledges this of Caleb, you, Caleb, followed my God fully. And in Joshua 14, 14, Joshua, the narrator, affirms it as well. He, Caleb, followed the Lord God of Israel fully. The Holy Spirit is clearly marking out this character. Watch him. Study him. Take note of him. Learn how to fully follow God from Caleb. The Bible depicts three seasons in the life of this great guy. And I'd like for us to look at each of those seasons briefly and learn three ways in which to fully follow God. Three seasons of his life, three ways to fully follow God. The action begins in Numbers chapter 13. Let me summarize a very familiar story for you. The Israelites have been in captivity in Egypt for several centuries, and God has just led them out miraculously under the leadership of Moses, the Exodus. And now God is ready to hand over the keys of the promised land to this newly liberated nation. That's where the story begins, Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself men, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. God's promise is an unambiguous statement, clear, categorical, certain. He is going to give them this land. And not only that, he is the one who is going to give them this land. Not their strategic enterprises, not their militaristic endeavors. God is going to give them this land. And you know what happens. Twelve spies, one of them, Caleb, are sent out to scope out this land and they come back with bad news. The land is good, but there are giants in them. Numbers 13, 32 and 33, the last two verses of this chapter. And I'll start in the middle of verse 32. The land through which we have gone, in spying it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Notice all these references to sight and vision. Therein lay a dilemma. Should they see those giants? Or should they hear and obey God who had promised them this land? Should they retreat in fear of visible giants? Or should they advance in confidence in an invisible God. An old story tells of a desert nomad who awoke in the middle of the night in his tent feeling rather hungry. So he lit a candle and began eating dates from a bowl beside the side of his bed. He took a bite from the first one and saw to his horror that there was a worm in it. So he threw it out. He took a second date, bit into it, and lo and behold, there was a worm in that one too. Ditto for date number three and date number four. Realizing now that if things continued in this sorry fashion, he wouldn't have any more dates left to eat, this resourceful gentleman quickly blew out the candle and gobbled up the rest of the dates. <laughs> That's saying, reality is only what I can see. And if I don't see the dates... The worms, worms don't exist. Reality, the Israelites also declared, is only what we see, and we see only giants. Go into the promised land? No way, what an insane idea. But Caleb, 
Caleb came to a different conclusion. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Here, in the first season of Caleb's life, he was trusting God's presence. Trusting God's presence. Reality, Caleb acknowledged, was more than what he could see or hear or smell or taste or touch. He knew God had promised, and so he was trusting God's presence. Trusting the presence of a God who even today continues to affirm to us the constancy of his presence. As for example, in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Will you trust in God's presence despite what you see? Granted, what we see is not all that hopeful. Economy in a free fall. Housing market in shambles. Job situations tenuous. Retirement accounts non-existent. Terrorism ever present. Will you continue to trust God? Will you continue to trust God as Caleb who said, the Lord is with us do not fear them. Add to this list your personal giants, problems with ministry, problems with relationships, problems with your health. An assortment of fearsome beasts, a whole legion of demonic nightmares threaten to fall upon us daily. And if we focus only on what we see, these augurs, We are going to miss out on the best that God is ready to give to us. Trust God's presence. Numbers 49, one more time. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Trust God's presence. Constantly be aware of God's presence, particularly the hustle and bustle of life and ministry. For six weird weeks in the fall of 2004, Udo Wechter had an unerring sense of direction. When he got out of the shower every morning, Wechter, part of an experiment at the University of Osnabrück in Germany, donned a wide beige belt lined with 13 vibrating pads, kind of like the gizmos that make our cell phones vibrate. The funny thing about those vibrating pads was that whichever one was facing north would always be going off. Always. There was never a time when one of those buzzers was always vibrating, constantly focusing Udo Vector on north. Deep into the experiment, Vector confessed, my sense of perception has shifted. I knew I could never get lost. I always had a map of the city in my head. Even when I was 100 miles away in Hamburg, I was standing in the cafeteria line and thinking, ah, I live over there. (laughs) He confessed that he felt the vibrations even in his dreams. We need a buzzer to orient us to north, to keep us constantly aware of God. Let me suggest for you a buzzer by which we can practice the presence of God at all times, even in our dreams. I am advocating a return to the age-old practice of praying the hours. Approaching God in prayer multiple times during the day, creating a, a habitual orientation of the heart to God, focusing on His presence. A great tool for that is the series of books by Phyllis Tickle, T-I-C-K-L-E, called The Divine Hours. It contains written prayers, mostly scripture, to be prayed through four times a day. The last two years that I have been working my way through those books has been a tremendous experience for me. It has been wonderful to formally set apart times of prayer, three to four times during the day, ten minutes at the most, outside of my regular quiet time, to constantly and deliberately focus upon God. May I suggest that you utilize a discipline of that sort for yourselves as well. This is a great time to start a spiritual discipline, the last few weeks of Lent. 
But if we are to focus on God's presence, trusting God's presence as Caleb did, it must begin with a deliberate paying attention to God at all times. The first season of Caleb's life, he was trusting God's presence. We must do so too. The second season of his life. You know what happened after Numbers 13. As a result of their lack of trust in God's presence, God punished them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until all the culpable adults, those over the age of 20, had perished. Caleb was 40 years old when it all first happened. We never hear of him till after the 40 years of Israel's chastisement. He would be 80 then. 40 of the best years of his life spent wandering aimlessly in the desert, and what's the worst thing about it? It was because of a rebellion in which he had no part. He would have been a great leader of his tribe had the Israelites taken possession of the land way back then. But instead, 40 years in the desert, in despair, in despondency, 40 years of anonymity, unsung, unheard, and he wasn't blame. Can you imagine how he must have felt? The book of Numbers, despite some interpretive difficulties, estimates that there, was, there were about 1.2 million adults over the age of 20 at the time God punished them. All of those 1.2 million people would have to die in 40 years, which meant 85 people had to die every day. Now, if you allot 12 hours a day in which to have funerals, that means seven funerals an hour, every day, every week, every month, every year for 40 years. A constant chilling reminder of the abject disobedience of the Hebrew children and the intense displeasure of God. And none of this was Caleb's fault. In fact, if they had only listened to him, this would never have happened. But instead, in 40 years, he sees an entire generation disappear. Maybe his parents, his brothers, his sisters, his cousins, his playmates. 40 years of eating manna in the desert and burying people. Waiting and waiting and waiting. How long, Lord? Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. As Max Lucado tells the story, one second the bird was peacefully perched in its cage singing. The next moment its life changed forever. Its problems began when its owner decided to clean its cage with a vacuum cleaner. She stuck the nozzle in to suck up the seeds and the feathers, and that's when the phone rang, and instinctively she turned to pick it up. She had barely said hello when, zoop, Chippy was gone. The lady gasped, dropped the phone, snapped off the vacuum, opened the zipper, the bag, and there was Chippy, alive but stunned and covered with heavy black dust. She grabbed the bird and rushed to the bathtub, turned the faucet on full blast, held Chippy under a torrent of ice-cold water, power-washing it clean. Then, of course, she did what every compassionate pet owner would do. She snatched up the hair dryer and blasted the wet, miserable, shivering little bird with hot air. <laughs> Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> Are you in a situation like that? Have you lost your song, suffering through no fault, of your own. Maybe you're blaming your parents or your spouse or your employer. I didn't cause this. This was not my fault. I am tired of being a victim. I want out. If that's what you're thinking, take a look at Caleb and the silence of 40 years. 40 years of neglect. 
40 years of unfairness, 40 years of innocent suffering. Did he quit? Did he hand in his notice and go into early retirement, washing his hands off his ungodly and uncouth fellow men? Not at all. He stayed put through thick and thin, knowing that God was working in and through tragedy. Because God was doing something, Caleb was trusting God's purpose. Here in the second season of Caleb's life, he was trusting God's purpose. Will you trust God's purpose? God knows where you are, what you are going through, what trials you are in. You may not be seeing it. You may not be feeling it. It might not be tangible. It might not be palpable. But God is working, reshaping, remolding, reformatting you in the wilderness of life. God is always working, building Christ's likeness in you, conforming you to the image of His Son. Will you trust His purpose? Even in the darkness, even in the silence, invisibility is not inaction on the part of God. Inaudibility is not inattention on the part of God. God is not on furlough. He is working. Trust God's purpose. I don't know what you are thinking of giving up. I don't know what towel you're ready to throw in. Maybe some of you are this far from quitting school or ministry or, God forbid, your marriage. I don't know. But I know one thing. God is working. Trust God's purpose. Hang in there. Stay put. Don't quit. In the second season of Caleb's life, Caleb was trusting God's purpose. We must do so too. Trust God's purpose. To fully follow God, we must trust God's presence. We must trust God's purpose. And here we come to the third season of Caleb's life. Forty years have gone by. All the adults over the age of 20 have died off. Now the nation under Joshua's leadership is getting ready to take over the promised land. And guess what Caleb is up to? Joshua chapter 14, verses 10, 11, and 12. Joshua 14, 10 through 12. Joshua 14, verse 10. Now behold, Caleb tells... The Lord has let me live just as he spoke for 45 years, from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Now then... Give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Look at that. Incredible. This guy is 85 years old and he's asking for a mountain. I'd have asked for a nice tropical island. Books to read, steaks to eat, Bach to listen to. Middle age, my age, they say, is when you want to find out where all the action is so that you can be someplace else. <laughs> the only thing I exercise these days is caution. <laughs> that's, that, that's not really true. I, I really get a lot of exercise, unlike what my colleagues at... Uh, in the PM department thing. I, I get a lot of exercise. I jump to conclusions. I beat around the bush. I throw my weight around. I, I get a lot of exercise. So there, Aubrey. Anyway, this guy, Caleb, when his contemporaries are contemplating retirement and cashing in on their investments, this dude is planning a conquest. Not for him the sinecure of a cushy job or the security of a peaceful retreat. Oh no, he wants that same city that had so distressed his fellow men 40 years ago. What a vision. 
What a testimony. And the book of Joshua tells us that he succeeds. Numbers 14, verse 8. Forty years afterwards, at the age of 85, Caleb is still on top of the spiritual game. Joshua 14, 8. I followed the Lord my God fully. And the secret in this third season of his life, Joshua 14, 11 and 12, one more time. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. And the bottom of verse 12, perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. In other words, I was strong then, I am strong now, but you know what's more important? I can win with the resources of God, with the wherewithal of God, with God's power. Here in this third season of Caleb's life, he was trusting God's power. Fully following God by trusting God's power. What is your vision for life? To finish strong? To do great things for God? Why not? Maybe you're thinking you don't have the capabilities and the resources. If that's what you're thinking, you are absolutely correct. You have neither capability nor resources. But our God, ah, that's a different story. Perhaps you're feeling the ache of lost opportunities. Perhaps you're feeling the burden of wasted years. Perhaps you're telling yourself, it's too late. Too late! It's never too late. This guy was 85. Trust God's power. Towards the end of the 19th century, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the newspaper. It read, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite who died yesterday, devised a way to kill more people in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. Actually, it was Alfred's older brother who had died, and the newspaper reporter had bungled the epitaph. But the account had a profound effect on Nobel. He decided he wanted to be known for something other than developing the means to kill people efficiently and amassing a fortune in the process. So he initiated the Nobel Prizes, one of which goes to people and institutions that foster peace instead of killing in a war. And then Nobel said these classic words. Every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. Here is your chance to correct your epitaph in midstream and write a new one. It's not too late. Opportunities are innumerable, and our God's power, illimitable. Take on a challenge, conquer a mountain, trust God's power. He can and he will use us if we are, like Caleb, fully following God, trusting God's presence even when all you see are insurmountable obstacles, trusting God's purpose even when you are in the most hideous of wildernesses, trusting God's power even when you don't have an ounce of strength. Like Caleb, fully follow God, trust God's presence, trust God's purpose, trust God's power. May the Holy Spirit help us to do that for God's glory, in Christ's name, amen.